My presentation will focus on three things. One, what is a national security strategy? Secondly, how do national security strategies contribute to good governance, to good security sector governance? And what are the key challenges in formulating a national security strategy? Well, I wanted to start with understanding you know, strategic foresight. Why strategic foresight? And I think it's very important for us to discuss that. The one question that I have for the, for the group, how can we formulate security strategies in the face of uncertainties? Right? It's a fundamental, a fundamental question emerging security sector leaders here must ask as they prepare for the future. Well, there are a few things you can agree with me, right? You can agree with me that before COVID-19 and before the Ukraine-Russia war, you know, rapid technology, uh, th technological change, growing economic independence, and mounting political instability had already conspired to make the future increasingly mur murky, right? Some researchers have used the, u the words uh, uh, such as VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity to define, you know, the kind of world we live in. Others have used the word, you know, tuna, right? Tuna for, you know, turbulence, uncertain, novel, and ambiguous to explain again the world that we live in. Who in this room hasn't been surprised by some of the events that are happening in this world, right? Have you had any, you know, challenges understanding what's happening? Or have you had, you know, in times of rapid changes, have you, have you had, a, uh, you know, a, a time where you felt like things were moving too fast for you? Well, for me, it's all about strategic foresight. And I'll tell you what uh, strategic foresight means. Strategic foresight, it's about exploring different plausible futures that could raise or that could arise and opportunities and challenges they could present, right? We then use those ideas to make better decisions and act now. And that's the whole point of, you know, national security strategy, right? We don't use strategic foresight to predict the future. That's not what we're trying to do because we're planning for the next five years. We're planning for the next 10 years as emerging security sector leaders. What you're using strategic foresight for is to influence, right, the, the now. And so in strategic foresight, the first exercise that you did in the first week really looked at some of the challenges that your countries are facing now. And so if I was to ask you, what are some of the challenges that you think your countries will be facing in the next five or 10 years, what would you say? And so you use strategic foresight to scan the horizon. You look uh, at the change the drivers. What are some of the things that are uh, causing the changes? You present some scenarios. And you looked at the opportunities and the challenges, and then you use that to inform your policy and uh, policy uh, implementation. And so that leads me to one of my favorites, my favorite quotes, if you don't mind me saying, from uh, uh, our own Kofi Annan. We will not enjoy development without security, and we will not enjoy security without development. And we will not enjoy either without respect for human rights or governance. And I think that's something that you've heard across the board uh, the entire week. So what is a national security strategy? Now that I said something about, you know, strategic foresight, a national security strategy, right, going into, into understanding national security strategy, there are a few things that we all have to agree on. And I think, you know, if you agree with me on these key themes that I'm going to uh, talk about, please raise your hand. The desire for securities is universal. Do you agree? That everybody wants security, okay? that uncertainty and danger, dominant feature of human existence, that to be secured is to be undisturbed by danger or fear, and if there are no threats, then the need to guarantee security will disappear. So it's because we have threats and challenges that we need to address or guarantee security, right? And so a national security strategy is a guiding vision of interest and values. It's a plan that links goals and resources to define, you know, to define a, a period of time. And we'll be talking about resources later this afternoon. And national security strategy, it's a process to coordinate elements of national power, be economic, security, political, diplomatic information. And then it's a theory of, uh, of success. Some countries have defined what they mean by national security. And I think it's quite important for us to already frame the conversation, partly because countries are already ahead, right? Countries understand that people need to be involved when it comes to defi uh, the definition of uh, national security. How do African countries define national security? 
Well, I'll give an example. Ghana, for example, looks at national security, national security from you know, a people-centric human security approach. So it's not just about you know, the states, but it also focuses on you know, the people, right? And it says, the sovereignty of Ghana resides in the people of Ghana, in whose name and for whose welfare the powers of government are to be exercised in the manner and within the limits laid down in this constitution. You find that also in the Nigerian uh, national security strategy, where it focuses on the citizens. It's all about the well-being of the well-being of the citizens. And in the Liberian national security strategy, the focus again is on Liberian citizen. So you find out that in talking about national security strategy, the focus here is not just on the state, and it's also about the people. And I think I want to make sure that we all get that uh, right. Why have a national security strategy? It's a question that's going to come at some point. Well, the African Union understands uh, that national security strategy is the way for good governance. And so the African Union policy framework on security sector reform 2013-2014 stipulates that every nation must have a national security strategy. And it says the national authority of member states will produce through a fully consultative, keep the word, consultative and participatory process a well-defined national security strategy based on democratic principles, human security needs, respect for human rights, and international humanitarian law. So the question about why develop a national security strategy, this is coming all the way from the African Union that most all member states have agreed to. And so when, why is so much attention growing about national security strategy? Well, I'll give you a couple answers. The first one is a changing concept of you know, security that we've discussed. For a long time, most countries focused on the states and not on the citizens. And so because there's a change in dynamics understanding security, a lot of countries are moving to develop their own national security strategy. The second is the four sites that I discussed in the beginning, the complicated threats environment. The environment is shaping, is changing, and so countries are beginning to think broadly. How do we actually adapt our strategy so that we actually uh, uh, we address some of the issues that countries will have in the next five or 10 years? The post-conflict uh, reconstruction era. So you find out that countries like Sierra Leone and Liberia started, uh, went into drafting their strategy right after the conflict. State building, uh, nation building, and of course, the changing political leadership. So in a country like uh, Zambia, for example, the new leadership has decided to draft uh, the national security strategy that will address some of the issues that the country will have. Now, the main idea here, when you hear national security strategy, is it must be developed to provide a coherent response, right? Because this week is about all about responses. A national security strategy is a tool that countries can use to provide a coherent response to security challenges, right? It requires a major effort in planning and anticipating problem. Again, anticipating problem, foresight. An inclusive approach, it has to be inclusive. The question will come later, why are some of the strategies not working? How is your strategy inclusive, right? It has to be inclusive despite difficulties related to the number and diversity of, of actors. Now, let me tell you about the Africa Center context, and I think it's very important that we talk about it. So the Africa Center started a journey to understand you know, the, 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 the layout when it comes to security and, and uh, uh, on, on the continent. And so with the national security strategy, what we are doing is looking at two different, you, you know, uh, uh, concepts. So we have the narrow national, you know, military concept that we've discussed in the room uh, uh, for the past two weeks and the broader security concept. And so for us, the reference point is, again, when you talk about traditional military, is the states. And when we talk about broader human security, we're looking at the states and the people, right? And so when it comes to, you know, the stakeholders, very important. In a traditional military con con uh, context, the executive and the military are the only ones involved in national security strategy development. In the broader human security uh, aspect, security sector and related government sectors are broadly involved in uh, the drafting and, uh, uh, of the national security strategy. In the traditional notion, you have exclusive, slided approach, only focused on a few, but in the broader women's security, it's inclusive, holistic. And so what we argue is that for you to be, the theory of change here is that for you to be able to draft a national security strategy that's, it, that's able to address some of the challenges that countries face, you have to go with the inclusive and holistic 
approach. The Africa Center started a journey a while back. And so the journey started perhaps here in Washington, D.C., even longer than that. But then, in, if memory serves me right, in January 2027, 2017, we brought in you know, experts, people who work on issues of national security here in Washington, D.C., to have a discussion about national security strategy. We had the same thing in Senegal, Dakar, in 2018, a third one in Gaborone in 2019, and then one also in Tunis in 2019. And then you, during the COVID period, we had you know, a number of uh, 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 virtual engagements. The idea here was really to understand how Africans, African colleagues understand national security strategy. If I remember very well, I had one of our former colleagues who uh, is at the, at the UN who said, well, the national security strategy has to look into, you know, take Africa's context into account. It has to be African uh, national security strategy. It cannot be uh, a strategy that's from uh, somewhere else. And so here, he was talking about ownership. And so the Africa Center was on a journey to understand ownership. What does national security strategy mean in the African context? And I'll tell you why I brought that up. You have the toolkit with you. Some of you already have it. And so that journey led us to the development or the drafting of the, the toolkit, right? Because most or, or perhaps 90% of everyone, of people who contributed to these toolkits are, are Africans. And so that was the idea. And so how did, did, did we come about this? With Dr. Emil and uh, other colleagues who are in the room, we looked at case studies of African countries that have somewhat started uh, drafting their strategy or have completed you know, their strategy. So we looked at uh, Botswana. You can see some of this on, on our websites. Botswana, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Gambia, Ghana, Liberia, Madagascar, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and South Sudan. We looked at what they were doing and wanted to see some common thread. What is it about these strategies right, that are common and what is not common about them? And so you can also read them when you have the chance. I, I will advise you to go online and just look at them separately, look at how countries are you know, looking at strategy and how countries are trying to address some of the security challenges they face. And so I'll give you, you know, the thread. The thread that's coming through all of them is you have to go with the five Ps. So if you forget everything I said this morning, always remember the five Ps, right? The five Ps. The first one is the process. The process is very important. What do we mean by the process? The process means that people have to be involved. You have to involve the stakeholders. The stakeholders have to be involved in the process. I'll give a quick example. Uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Windsor, who is from Zambia, uh, it's not necessarily what you call a traditional security uh, 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 person, but she's a member of the drafting team, the drafting team of the national security strategy in, in the Zambia. The product is very important. The end results, right? You have to implement the strategy. The priorities that you set for yourselves, again, talking about ownership, the first week was about the exercise, understanding what you prioritize when it comes to security. What you prioritize in your, in your, in your security is what you, you, you resource, right? So uh, the people, the people have to be at the center of the strategy. The people are, you know, the ones that, you know, the strategy is for. You're trying to secure the people and therefore they have to be involved. So in terms of how do you involve them? We can talk about consultations, for example. There are different mechanisms when it comes to uh, consultation. And the last P is the partnerships, right? The partnerships, partly because your strategy is, again, our recommendation is that you don't classify your strategy, right? The, the first slide when you came in, what you saw was the Ghanaian strategy. It's open source. You saw the Nigerian strategy is open source. And so the strategy being open source will allow your partners to understand where you're trying to go with it. Right? So the question will come later, why should we not classify the strategy? Our argument is there are parts of the strategy that you can classify, but there's also part of the strategy that you have to leave open. Because you consulted your citizens, your citizens have to see where you're trying to go with, uh, with the country in the next five or in the next uh, uh, seven, seven years. A good national security strategy must reflect a country's unique strategy right, and culture. And this is where we talk about ownership. And so by ownership, the strategy must be realistic. It must be realistic. It must be understandable, right? So a strategy that's, you know, a, a, a thousand pages will not work, right? It must be uh, understandable. It must be resource informed, right? And it must articulate priorities, trade-off, and uh, associated risk. So this afternoon, we'll be talking about trade-offs. We'll talk about, you know, the risk. But I think a strategy, these are some of the lessons learned. 
that any strategy that's not realistic, you'll have challenges implement, uh, implementing it, right? Because already in the room, we sense, you know, that colleagues have talked about, you know, strategies or policies are not being implemented. And I think it's very important for us to understand that if the policy is not realistic, if it's not owned by the government or by the people, if it's not understandable, the people who implement it will have challenges implementing it into it. So the challenges of you know national security uh, strategy. I think the first one is the conflict of leadership, right? And I am sure you, you know uh, for those that are in the group with uh, Dr. Emil, he can speak about the conflict of leadership. Where in some countries, you know, it's either the Department of Defense that wants to take the lead of the strategy, or the Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or the Office of the President. And so that's some of the challenges that we have seen when it comes to uh, 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 leadership. The second one is the political will and support. What we have seen is we have people who are very much willing without naming countries. We, we've seen that there are people who are willing to actually go that way, moving forward with strategic oversight, understanding the landscape and draft the strategy. But sometimes they do not have the political support uh, from uh, their leadership. The inability to involve the beneficiary. In fact, Dr. Kelly and I were in one particular country, again, without naming the name, uh, where we had, you know, folks in the military tell us that, well, you know, we're drafting the strategy and we tried to involve the civilians and the civilians were not willing to join. So we, we took the helm and we, 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 we went ahead and we have the strategy. So the strategy is very much militarized because the civilians didn't want to be involved. And, and uh, she can speak to that also in, uh, in your group. Uh, unrealistic goal setting, I think I just talked about it. You know, the strategy has to be, you know, focused on the goals. You know, confidence deficiency, the people do not have confidence in the leadership or in the strategy and planning and resources. I would not touch on the resource piece, but partly because we talk about it, Dr. Johnson, uh, we'll talk about it later this afternoon. Well, some of the key takeaways that I wanted to share as my, uh, my time is running now, I think the first one is strategic understanding of issues and situation. My personal uh, uh, experience has been that in most places that we have been, with Dr. Emil, for example, in Niger, and uh, with Dr. Luca in the Zambia, when the people who are at the table do not understand the issues, then the strategy is not going anywhere, right? People have to understand the issues. They have to understand some of the challenges that the country is facing for them to be at the table. The definition of broader national security vision. How do you define national security vision? What we have seen also is that in some countries, the definition of national security vision already is sometimes already articulated in the constitution. You don't have to start from scratch, right? You can go back and make references to some of the documents that are already existing. National ownership and leadership. This is very key. Personally, I think it's one of my favorite, uh, you know, when it comes to key takeaways. If you do not have ownership of the strategy, Ownership means you are the one in the driver's seat. You are the one drafting the strategy. The Africa Center will never draft the strategy for anyone. What we do is we support. We only share our experiences from country to country. We will never take a pen and draft the strategy. And so you need to be in ownership. You have to draft your uh, strategy to be able to implement it. And we've seen countries where you know, uh, uh, donors or partners have been involved in drafting the strategy and now the strategy is just sitting on the shelf and nobody wants to implement it, right? The, the, uh, the next one is the importance of participatory inclusive process. It has to be inclusive and, and participatory. If it's not inclusive, people will not buy into it. People will not, you know, people will not even want to hear about it. And so inclusivity and in the process, participatory, you know, the consultation process, we think it's very important. There are many forms of consultation and we can talk about it. Countries go about it differently and I think it's very important. Uh, the, the next one is, you know, the relevance of a holistic approach, you know, very broad approach, understanding that security is not just about, you know, the military is, you know, more about, you know, everything else. You can talk about health, you can talk about climate. Uh, uh, the, the next one is the parliamentary oversight, making sure that the parliament, one way or the other, is involved at some point, right? So even if the members of parliament are not involved, the staffers have to be involved. Right, and we have a parliamentarian here. Hopefully, he uh, he he will speak to that in in your group. How you know resources are allocated if you do not have a strategy? How do they div, uh, you know give resources to the different ministries without a strategy? The flexibility and adaptability based on resources. Right, the strategy has to be flexible and adaptable. 
right? Again, that's why we started the conversation with the foresight. Looking into the future, your strategy has to be adaptable. In fact, I'll give one a quick example before going to the leveraging of partnership. In the U.S., one will argue, or most of you have seen, that the, the defense strategy came out before you know, the national security strategy. And one reason for that is because the, the, the war in Ukraine uh, broke out. Speaking to uh, my, my, my leadership, what happened was the strategy was in taking its course. They were drafting the, uh, the strategy, and then the Ukraine war broke out. And therefore, people needed to go back to the drawing board and re-look at the strategy and see if it's adaptable and if it actually addresses some of the issues that the U.S. was concerned about. And the last one is leveraging partnership. In some countries, what we have seen is in the press of drafting the strategy, you know, the team has actually invited you know, uh, ambassadors who are in the country to actually give them a portion of the strategy, not the entire strategy, just to, you know, get their input on things that perhaps they can support or things that, you know, uh, just getting, you know, broad ideas about, you know, the, the, the strategy and the outlook for uh, the country. Let me conclude with one of my favorite quotes because we're in Emerging Security Sector Leaders Program. Uh, it says, he or she who thinks he or she's leading and has no one following is just taking a walk. And I, I, and I think it speaks to you know, national security strategy. If you don't have a strategy, if you don't have a vision, people who, nobody will follow you. People will not know where you are going. And articulating your vision, it's vital for leadership. Right? A vision enables you, uh, you and your team you know, to resonate and to do the work of the people.